from great experience, uh, personal and professional, when it comes to talking about tech, uh, IT, the industry, and specifically the uh, digital space as well. So we couldn't have had anybody better than Ravi to be here. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to begin by asking you, how would you define India's place today in what we call the digital world? And what is it that you specifically, your government specifically is doing to maintain whatever competitive edge we have or to safeguard India's interest today? Look, I think, uh, I mean, all of us are reasonably aware of what transformation India has gone through in the last 10 years. And we can speak to transformation in almost every segment of our life. But certainly in the digital and tech space, the transformation has been, I mean, I'm not a man used to being very really, uh, adjective driven, but certainly in technology, you cannot but use the word spectacular. In the last 10 years, what we've seen in this country is that we've gone from being a nation that was predominantly an IT, ITES a nation with uh, being the back office, the phrase used to be used, uh, to the world's enterprises and governments to now an ecosystem and an innovation economy that basically spans the entire digital ecosystem, uh, current and emerging. So whether you look at AI, whether you look at semiconductors, whether you look at electronic systems of the future, whether you look at Web3, whether you look at, you know, any of these areas that you look at as you look to the future, an Indian flag, an Indian startups, and Indian innovation is there front and center uh, across the landscape. So that is one. The second is the most important aspect of what has happened in the last 10 years is that India and Indian talent is now being seen not just as a uh, place to have a cost arbitrage or have a back office based in India, but really from a point of view of being a partner in shaping the future of tech. And I think that transformation is not a trivial one, it is really a significant one, and it is something that we intend to protect, nurture, and continue to catalyze. This is our Prime Minister's vision. In terms of, pro you know, you make a broader point about protecting our interests. I think we are certainly at a stage, at a launching pad, an inflection point, where we are going to only grow for it. And there are, of course, there are going to be uh, challenges that we will face uh, from certain neighbors of ours who don't like the rise of India, don't like India's leading role in shaping the future of tech. And there will be many of these things that will play out in the global stage. But I can, I, I certainly, without the risk of overstating, can tell you today, that the rockets that is the Indian tech and innovation ecosystem is certainly now in orbit and it is an unstoppable uh, force driven by hundreds and thousands of uh, innovative minds and startup all over the country. And digital content and digital media certainly is one very important element of that. I will come specifically to digital content and media. Uh, when I landed there, the High Commissioner in the UK told me that there were seven ministers of the UK government that wanted to meet me. So obviously, being a politician, I said, wow, I have suddenly hit the international stage and there are seven UK ministers who want to meet me and I'm very important and all of that. Then I drove to the hotel and then it was clarified to me that they didn't want to meet me, they wanted to meet the startups. <laughs> so three days after meeting startups and all these ministers came just to experience what these youngsters are doing and why they were doing it. On a Sunday, the last day of our stay there, uh, we had a breakfast with Boris Johnson, who was just a prime minister there. And he said, he held my hand and he said, what is Narendra Modi feeding these youngsters in India that you have this confidence and talent? So I said, he's not doing anything by way of feeding them. And this is the answer to your question. Essentially, what has happened in the last 10 years is that government is now, and the policies of our prime minister is all about enabling the talent and success, that the talent and the initiative and the effort that always was there. And uh, I come from an era where I was also an entrepreneur in the pre Narendra Modi era. And I can tell you, it was a struggle, it was a pain, it was about dealing with uh, government that put the roadblocks at every stage of your uh, development. And instead, in the last 10 years, what you have is policy making and government that is a stakeholder in the success of uh, a young entrepreneur or a young uh, 
person with an idea. So I think that is the qualitative structural change and that is what is clearly caused uh, great this kind of momentum uh, that you are seeing today. And I, I'll tell you again, one. What you are seeing today, again I am not a person used to overstating or rhetoric, is a tip of the iceberg. The next wave of startups, the next wave of innovation that's around the corner <coughs> is going to be deeper, much more tectonic than what we've seen in the last five years. Absolutely. Uh, I do want to ask you, you're at the forefront of policy, uh, you're at the forefront of uh, trends, and you interact uh, with, you know, not just the tech industry all around the world, but obviously governments all around the world to understand concerns globally. What, according to you, is the biggest challenge? I may be contrarian on this, a lot of people say infrastructure, computers and so on and so forth. I really think the biggest challenge, and I don't say this as a, this is not an unsurmountable challenge, but it is a goal that we must meet, is that we have to make our talent pool really global standard and we have to aim for really this kind. In areas like semiconductors and artificial intelligence, it is no longer enough to be just an engineer or just have a master's, or just have an undergraduate, or just have a PhD. You really need the ability to research and innovate. You need the research and innovation embedded in your colleges and universities and in, your, in the places that you work. And therefore, in this budget, when the Honorable Prime Minister announced $12 billion, 1 lakh crores a seed money, not even the final amount, the seed money for research and innovation, I think that is a sign and a signal to how important, how much importance Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji places on shaping the potential and then catalyzing the potential of our young Indians into really global standard talent. The real challenge for the world today, Shwani, is not GPUs or AI computer infrastructure or data centers or the internet infrastructure. It is about where do you get these smart young minds from that will shape, innovate and create uh, solutions in the coming decade, in the coming decade. So, and I, I think the answer, we will all collectively agree, is that a large part of the talent should come from India and can come from India. When we're chasing the eight ball, uh, you seem to be very optimistic that we don't need to fear the kind of technologies we're looking at coming at us. I don't think we should fear technology. I think that is, uh, I mean, it is like fearing what is inevitable. Uh, you know that AI is the greatest invention in our lifetime. Uh, I come uh, from a time, and maybe obviously that of an old man, that I did my master's thesis 30 years ago in uh, AI, 25 years ago in AI. And those days we struggled to train a model with eight parameters and six parameters, and we failed. Huge amount in the last few years, and it is inevitable that AI will shape. But what we can do as government is not to fight that or impede that or roadblock that, uh, but to harness it fully and create the guardrails and accountability on the platform that offer AI, offer AI trained solutions to our consumers to be accountable for the safety and trust of those platforms. So our approach is very, very simple, clear and consistent. Whether you are a big tech from US or wherever, whether you are a company in India, whether you are a small company, big company, what you give to our consumers have to, has to be safe and trusted. The digital nagrik's rights to consume safe and trusted content is something we believe is the duty of the government to ensure. And for that, we will be, we are and we will continue to legislate in a manner where platforms that deliver AI are accountable for the safety and trust of the data. So whether you are a social media platform or you are a, a shopping e-commerce platform or you are or a chat GPT like uh, uh, generative AI platform, we will insist and uh, on the safety and trust of the platform before the platform is made publicly accessible by the consumer. And uh, it will be accountability under law. So there is none of this, what we've seen for decades of self-regulation, guidelines, try it if you can, a small nudge and a small day. These will be legally accountable guardrails where platforms cannot trespass and cannot allow their users to trespass into criminality or harm using those AI platforms. Yeah, and you talked about your own thesis 25 years ago. Personally, for you, Minister, this must be a really exciting time. Yeah, I don't know. I say this. Uh, I have had the privilege and uh, good fortune of going to many, many colleges, campuses, over 80 college campuses over the last two and a half years. 
and I will say this with the utmost responsibility, this is the most exciting time to be in tech, whether you are in deep tech or you are in media tech or you are in digital media or whatever, this is certainly the most exciting period to be a stakeholder and important. And of course, even for a grizzled veteran like me, it is a uh, it is certainly most exciting time for me as well and it's an absolute privilege to be a sort of participant in the unfolding of this great story and the Indian tech story. Unlawful not just under the IT Act, unlawful under the criminal code. For example, CSAN. Now, nobody can argue that prohibiting child sexual abuse material on any platform on the internet is an overreach. Nobody can argue, for example, that any content that violates somebody else's ownership patent is overreach because it's a violation under some law. Nobody can uh, argue that misinformation and deep fakes of using patently false information is an overreach because under the criminal code, under 469, under 177, under 4G, these are all prosecutable crimes. But particularly just information on government. No, no, there is nothing. We are saying today that there are categories of content that are unlawful under the law. Those, just because you are on the internet, that suddenly doesn't become lawful. And the internet certainly cannot become a space where there is no, the law does not reach. So what we are saying is today, every one of those 11 pieces of unlawful prohibited content is unlawful under the criminal law. So these are all prohibited under law in any case in the real world, and there cannot be an argument that it has to be permitted in the cyber world. The concern is particularly over what is deemed false and fake uh, pertaining to the, any business of the government and a you know, government mandated body deciding what is right or what is wrong. Again, it's a, it's a misreading and misunderstanding of it. Number one, there is nothing subjective about patently false. If you say 1 plus 1 equals 3, that is patently false. If not in today's world. No, well, then, then you and I have a disagreement on that. I, I put, I don't, I am not a woke, and I certainly don't get into uh, saying ambiguity on issues like one plus one may not be three. I'm not in that world. I, you know, I, I have to protect uh, the Indian citizens from anybody who goes and says one plus one is not uh, two. It could be three. Mm -hmm. So that is certainly our duty to protect people who go and preach that. So if you if you believe one plus one is three, then that is a problem that you have. It is certainly not a problem that I I can solve for uh, anybody. But having said that, what I'm saying today is even the fact check unit, which the uh, there was agitated by a comedian who went to the Mumbai High Court, and there's a story that that statement itself is a story. Uh, uh, the the court in a split decision has found that uh, this needs to be referred to a third judge. What the fact check unit was doing was. Simply because intermediaries wanted help from the government in determining what is wrong and right about the government and because no third party can determine whether a government decision is really right or wrong because only the government has the information for it. So the fact check unit was a response to a demand by intermediaries or a request from intermediaries saying we are unable to determine what is right and wrong and what is unlawful in the absence of information from the government, he said, okay, the government will volunteer a fact check unit telling you what is right and wrong. Number one. Number two, we never said that a platform needs to take down the content. We said, what is in dispute should be labeled. As saying disputed. Uh, now, if people have a problem with that, that's fine. How that becomes censorship? In my book, censorship is when a government mandates without establishing any basis in law, saying take down this, I don't like this, take down this, I don't like this. This is not what we are doing. We are saying very clearly, 12 types of content are unlawful. If you are a social media platform, you certainly should not have your user uh, posting that content. And if you continue to want to have your user anonymous, then you lend yourself to being prosecuted and your safe harbor drops. That's it. At the same time, uh, recently India has been rated top at risk of fake news and misinformation. How do you look at that? No, no, I, I look at that with great concern and I, I look at that uh, in a sense uh, uh, of validation of what we have been saying since October of 2022. We put out the rules, we talked about fake news way before the world woke up to it. We talked about deep fakes in October 22, way before anybody it became fashionable to talk about. 
because we sense this. We are today a country with 90 crore Indians using the internet. We are surrounded by people who are deeply desiring of slowing down India's rise. They see today no longer an option to fight us at the border. They see no longer an option to use terrorism as a tool. They see clearly an option to use the internet, use misinformation to cause law and order and chaos and disturbances in India as a very, very soft, vulnerable underbelly of the Indian democracy. And that is why every step we are taking today is on one hand to ensure that no citizens' fundamental rights are ever transgressed or violated. We are the trustees of that. The government considers that we are trustees of protecting citizens' fundamental rights. At the same time, understanding that this is a real challenge and a real problem and that we have to have legislative guardrails that ensure platforms are accountable for the correctness or for the trust of the content that they put out there for consumers. Therefore, there is a responsibility that is passed on platform to be doubly and triply sure that what consumers consume is really the truth and safe and safe and trusted as uh, Tanmay mentioned today. And that is in my opinion a shared goal for anybody who wants the Indian internet to be a robust, healthy, profitable, monetizable internet rather than an internet that is toxic with content that is 50% unsure, unverified, nobody knows what the truth is, nobody knows which platform delivers the truth of which platform. That is certainly not a goal that any one of us wants uh, on the Indian internet. Tendencies of big tech as far as revenue share is concerned. We've seen certain continents, certain countries move towards this direction. Could India be the next? No, so India has already spoken, our government has already spoken that we are concerned uh, that there is a deep asymmetry between those who create content and those who help the content creators monetize that content. We, as a, from a policy making point of view, we want the internet to be open. What does open mean? We don't want the internet or the commercial, the monetization of the internet to be the, in the purview of or to be controlled by just one or two or three companies. That's very, very clear about that. We don't like monopolies, we don't like duopolies. We saw the recent action by the NCAP and the Competition Commission against Google. We, are we concerned about ad tech monopolies and duopolies? Certainly. Do we have an answer for that? Certainly. The Digital India Act in its pre-consultation laid out this as one of the issues that we were going to deal with. That we were certainly going to have to deal with with this very, very pronounced and very visible asymmetry between the small guy or even the medium to big guy in the Indian content creation ecosystem and these big platforms that are in a sense the gatekeepers to monetizing the content. And that asymmetry I believe needs to be legislated or at least at the, at the very least in, uh, very uh, least regulated through rules of a new legislation and I am hopeful that after uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, resumes office that uh, this will be one of his priorities to so, train their models and there is a case that is now underway in the US New York Times versus OpenAI uh, that I think will be the defining case on what are the rights of a digital use platform or indeed anybody even an individual who puts content that he or she has created out there for public consumption, does he or she forego all rights just because they put it out for public consumption vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a model that uses that content to train and then monetize that uh, trained model. So I think this is a very defining case. I personally, and I'm giving you my personal point of view, I think uh, that is not a tenable model. I, as I said, the basic principle is that the content creator whether he or she has put it out there in the public or has kept it behind a paywall or some other way of safeguarding it, must have a right to whatever value comes out of the monetization of that content is my uh, thought as an individual, as a matter of principle. Now, how do we enshrine that, legislate that, how do we make that happen? That is an issue that we will have to discuss. Shortly, as we navigate the ever changing landscape of digital media, it's time I introduce our guest of honor today, Sri Anurag Thakurji, Minister of Information and Broadcasting of India, to share his insights on the world's regulating the relationship between publishers and big tech around the world. Please
join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Sri Anurag Thakurji to the stage. Enjoy your dinner and have a wonderful night.